Hey, I'm Mark. Let's get to work. Get that door closed. What now? Yeah. You know, you're going to need to press a little harder. The battery's a little weak in your remote. All right, let's get rolling. I'm a history teacher, and I'm going rogue. So let's take a look at Dorothy, the Scarecrow, and the rest. Let's find the historical meaning behind the wonderful Wizard of Oz. Let's go rogue. Most of us have seen the Wizard of Oz. If you haven't, go back to Russia, you freaking commie. But I digress. You know, the original book was written by L. Frank Baum in 1900, then turned into a musical stage play in 1902. The movie we know of was produced by MGM Studios and released in 1939. Oh, it is the wonderful story of Dorothy, a young girl who lives with her Aunt Ham and Uncle Henry in rural Kansas in the late 1800s. Dorothy has a wild heart that refuses to be tamed. She wants to leave the farm and do something better, somewhere over the rainbow. Dorothy's dog, Toto, has the same idea. Get out and see the world, except he keeps getting into Ms. Gulch's flowers. She threatens to have Toto euthanized, then kidnaps the dog and sets out to do the real thing. Toto escapes from a not very well-secured basket on the back of Ms. Gulch's bicycle and returns to Dorothy. Yes, okay, get to the tornado. All right, a tornado strikes the farm. Dorothy can't get into the shelter, so she hides in her bed in her house. The tornado lifts the house off of its foundation and Dorothy and Toto are sent into the land of Oz. The house crashes down on the Wicked Witch of the East, and Dorothy ends up with her ruby slippers. I'll get there. She wants to return home, but doesn't know how. The village of Munchkins tells her to go to the Emerald City, and the wonderful Wizard of Oz will send her home to Kansas. She was to get there by following a yellow brick road. Along the way, she meets a scarecrow, a tin man, and a cowardly lion and the Wicked Witch of the West. Once in the Emerald City, the wizard tells the crew that he will help them, but only if they bring him the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West. They get into an amazing final battle with all kinds of cool weapons. I mean, lightsabers and drones and blasters and... Oh, Scarecrow douses her with water, and she melts. And that's it. So, what is she doing when it rained? I mean... That doesn't make any sense. Now, they bring back the witch's broomstick to the Wizard of Oz, and he sends Dorothy home. No, he can't. He's not a real wizard. It's a guy behind the curtain that's operating the fake Wizard of Oz. So why was Toto the first to pull back the curtain? Really? Ozians? In the 10 years that he was there, no one wondered what a random curtain was doing in the middle of Oz's throne room? Well, the wizard is exposed. He follows through on promises made to the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Cowardly Lion. But what about Dorothy? The wizard loads up a hot air balloon to take her, him and her back to Kansas, the land of E Pluribus Unum. Toto gets away from Dorothy, chasing a cat. And while Dorothy goes after her dog, the hot air balloon lifts off. Not to worry, Glinda shows up and tells Dorothy all she had to do the whole time was to click her heels together three times and say, there's no place like home. And she would return home. Shazam! It works! Dorothy promises that she never wants to leave home again, which will make marriage a tough proposition until you reach marriage age. Roll credits. The Wizard of Oz is not just a standalone movie. It can be seen as a 112-minute children's fairy tale, but why? Let's go rogue. If you have a test coming up on the populist movement, you might want to take some notes. I'm about to get you an A. See, the populists were a political party in the late 1800s. They were mainly made up of Western farmers in states like Kansas. Neither the Republican Party nor the Democratic Party took much interest in what was occurring in the West, so leaders of farming organizations created the Populist Party to represent their interests in the state governments than they hoped in Washington, D.C. So what were the interests of the farmers in the Midwest? Farmers lived in a cycle of poverty. They required bank loans to buy seed and other implements in the spring and paid back the loans in the fall after harvest. Adding to the poverty of the farmers was the exorbitant cost of moving their product to the markets back east by railroad. Farmers didn't have the ability to pay to play one railroad off of another. They were subject to whoever's track was closest to their farm. In good years, the railroads would raise their rates. In bad years, they would lower them. 
allowing farmers just enough profit to stay in business for another year. L. Frank Baum, author of the book, worked for the populist effort to elect William Jennings Bryan president in 1896. Bryan lost to Republican William McKinley. His experience with Bryan and the aftermath will be woven tightly into the children's fairy tale. So let's set the stage for The Wizard of Oz. Dorothy is the average American, young, innocent, wants to get out and see the world. Oh, and she's from Kansas, one of the populist strongholds. Dorothy's dog is Toto. One of the groups that was closely associated with the populace was the Prohibition Party, which sought to end the manufacture, sale, and consumption of alcohol. Can you say 18th Amendment? The common term for someone opposed to alcohol is teetotaler, hence the name Toto. That sets us up for the tornado. The tornado that launches Dorothy into the land of Oz is representative of the economic meltdowns of the late 1800s, a panic in 1873 with bank failures and a four-year depression, and similar panics in 1884, 1890, and 1893 with more bank failures. All of these are parts of the business cycle that occurs naturally, but in the capitalist system like the United States at the time, without a Federal Reserve system or inner understanding of fiscal policy, the panics were much deeper than the recessions we have today. The tornado drops Dorothy's house in Munchkinland, a town where people gather into organizations like the Lollipop Guild and the Lullaby League and give guests the key to the city. East Coast, middle class people. The Munchkin is more of a description of social status rather than physical size. E middle class East Coasters don't have to buy things on credit in the 1890s and they aren't subject to the whims of the railroads like those out west. Being a Munchkin is a good life as long as Glinda's around to take care of you and the trolley can take you out to Coney Island on the weekends. Dorothy's house crushes the Wicked Witch of the East. The only things sticking out from under the house are her black and white striped socks and her ruby red slippers. MGM made a significant change from the bomb book. In the book, the slippers were silver. In the late 1800s, the United States money supply was based on gold, the gold standard. The amount of money in the system was based on how much gold was in American reserves. Therefore, the Munchkins advised Dorothy to follow the yellow brick road. Whoever had the gold controlled the money supply, and that was the banks. The Wicked Witch of the East represents the East Coast banks that kept the money supply locked up and kept farmers in a cycle of poverty by charging them high interest for loans. How could populace add, add to the money supply and free the farmers from the tyranny of banks? if they could add another precious metal to the money supply. Silver. Dorothy, the average American, loosens the silver supply from the witch, taking her silver slippers, and as she dances a bimetallic jig along the Yellow Brick Road, on the way to see the Wizard of Oz. By the way, Oz, O-Z. That's the abbreviation for ounces. Which is, the, which is what gold is measured in. Well, killing the witch of the East really miffs her sister, the wicked witch of the West, the second oppressor of Western farmers, the railroads. In the eyes of the farmers, the railroads set rates that kept them in, in the cycle of poverty. With the, witch of the, with the wicked witch of the East out of the way, the witch of the West, the railroads, redoubles her effort to destroy Dorothy. So along the Yellow Brook Road, the first person Dorothy befriends is the scarecrow. The scarecrow represents the American farmer. If I only had a brain. An 1896 article accused the farmers of Kansas of ignorance, irrationality, and general muddle-headedness. Perfect description of the scarecrow. The second person Dorothy befriends is the tin man. The tin man represents the American worker, a constituency that the populist party tried to attract in their effort to become a national party. The populace promoted a series of programs for workers to draw them. When Dorothy and Scarecrow come upon the Tin Man, he's rusted, and Dorothy oils his joints to get him working again. In the 1890s, the United States had suffered from a string of recessions, and workers spent many weeks at a time out of work. The populist party suggested that they needed the American people, Dorothy, to grease the skids to get him back to work. The third person Dorothy meets along the Yellow Brick Road is the Cowardly Lion. The lion represents William Jennings Bryan, WJB, 
who ran for president in 1896 on both the populist and the Democratic Party's tickets. Bryan had a huge roar as a brilliant orator. The press sometimes compared him to a roaring lion. At the 1896 Democratic Convention in Chicago, he roared, we shall answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down on the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind on this cross of gold. But Brian was never able to put words into action. In the book, the lion hits the tin man with his own axe, but doesn't dent him. The populace, with WJB at the helm, didn't get much support from labor, in spite of Brian's roaring. Eventually, the crew reaches the Emerald City, which represents, very good, Washington, D.C. Why Emerald? Hmm, could it be the color of money? And what do people do in Washington all, with all that Emerald money? Oh, ho, 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 ha, 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 and a couple of tra-la-las. That's a good life. They sing a nice tune to the voters, really do nothing else, and get themselves reelected. The Wizard of Oz, if you haven't guessed, is the president. In 1900, that was William McKinley, who had the uncanny ability to be all things to all people. It could just as easily be any other president of the time, a mere figurehead, as someone behind the curtain pulls the levers. In the Republican Party, the lever puller was Mark Hanna, who would sit in a cigar smoke-filled room with the likes of Morgan and Rockefeller and choose the party's next candidate for president. So what happens when the crew shows up in Washington, D.C.? At first, the door gets slammed in their face. After persistent knocking, they're led into the Emerald City, sat down, primped, groomed, made to feel good, then sent to see the wizard slash president. Before he will grant them their wish, he requires some payback, pay to play, quid pro quo the destruction of this thing that is constantly a thorn in his side. Dorothy and the squad do the job. The reward for ridding the wizard of this problem, he gives him crap, excuse me, trinkets. He gives the scarecrow a piece of paper, which he calls a diploma. Then the scarecrow promptly screws up the Pythagorean theorem. And when the scarecrow asks how he can thank the wizard, the wizard answers, well, you can't. Presidents don't normally need the votes of Western farmers. He gives the cowardly lion a medal, a participation trophy. He gives the tin man a clock, which is interesting, because factory workers are always conscious of the clock. Clock in, clock out, you're on the clock. But what about Dorothy? The wizard essentially pats Dorothy on the American public on the head and sends her back home. Beat it, kid. You're bothering me. Go home. Back to your regular life. And we'll run the country. Click your heels three times and she goes home. And the people in the Emerald City go back to running the country. The historical populist party was not a force on the national level. It won control of the governments of some Western states. As its platform became more, shall we say, popular, it was adopted by the Democratic Party. Farmers responded by joining the Dems. In a weird way, though, it was a Republican president that challenged the powers behind the curtain. When New York governor and war hero Teddy Roosevelt was nominated as vice president, Mark Hanna, the Republican kingmaker, complained, that damn cowboy is only a heartbeat away from the presidency. When McKinley was assassinated the next year, Roosevelt became president and adopted much of the populist platform, breaking up monopolies and regulating banks and railroads. The wonderful Wizard of Oz, more than meets the eye, rogue. You know what movie was also released by Columbia Pictures in 1939? The Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Ja, 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 Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart, Jimmy Stewart is Jefferson Smith. Just like Dorothy, the average American. He gets appointed senator from an unnamed state in the West. When he gets to Washington, his opponents take him for as a country bumpkin, like Dorothy. When he discovers that there's a man behind the curtain pulling the levers of a political machine trying to get money from graft, they try to expel him from the Senate and send him home, just like Dorothy. Significant? 1939, what a great year for movies. The Wizard of Oz, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, they were both nominated for the Academy Award for Best Picture. They both lost to a little film called Gone with the Wind. Still rogue. Hey, thanks for being in class today. I hope you had fun or you learned something. Preferably both. Leave a comment. Give a thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe. Share this with your friends. Check out some of my other videos. I want to thank my producer, Casey Moulton, and Paige for running the teleprompter, and Mr. Brent Allen for letting us borrow his studio here on the campus of Columbia High School. Yeah, I had fun, but I don't quit my day job. And remember, I'm Mark Haggard.
I'm a history teacher, and I've gone rogue. <laughs>